Oral questions, questions orales, the Honourable Member for Thornhill. Another day and more evidence of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister at that is just not worth the cost. Former bank governor and proud liberal David Dodge says the new federal budget certainly is not helpful to dealing with the inflationary fire, making it harder for Canadians' families to afford anything. Young people saddled with this prime minister's addiction to spending. The call is coming from inside of the Liberal House. Will the prime minister listen to experts, to business leader, to his own party, and millions of Canadians struggling to get by and just stop the spending? Stop it. The Honourable... Parliamentary Secretary. The lowest debt and deficit in the G7, Madam Speaker, a triple A credit rating, and a budget that presents a, me a message of fairness for this country, fairness for current and future generations, a vision that they would cut. They already, before even reading the budget, said that they would not support it. That is a budget that supports child care, that supports pharma care, and understanding that Canadians have to have dental care in this country. Canadians who can't otherwise afford it will have the support of this government. And that more homes be built, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker. That is vital in this country, and they're standing against every single one of those. Good answer. Member for Thornhill. Madam Speaker, the problem is, is that nobody believes them anymore, and this budget is the opposite of fairness. It is unfair to saddle our kids with billions of dollars of debt that they'll be paying for years. It is unfair to force the inflationary spending onto grocery bills of every single family. It is unfair to keep interest rates high while millions struggle to pay their mortgages. The, the number of Canadians who can't afford to pay their bills has more than doubled over the last month. So will the Liberals finally fix the budget so Canadians can keep their homes, put gas in their cars, and put food on their table? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition and the Conservative Party seem to be good at uh, posing for photo ops and pretending to care about people in food bank lineups. Well, our government has introduced the most care. comprehensive package they of competition care. reforms in Canadian history to increase competition and bring down grocery prices. But how cruel and heartless do you have to be mm. as care. a party to vote against feeding kids That's in school? Right. Shame. Shame. And that party over there has voted once already against the National School Food Program, and we've introduced it in Budget 2024, and we're going to see them vote. No member for Thornhill. Mirror, mirror on the wall. That's all I hear from that member. The speaker, the, the, Mr. Madam Speaker, the spending spree just isn't limited to the costly government photo ops that he's talking about. He's been here for nine years. The Liberal insiders and elites are the ones getting on, in on the action, too. We learned this week that the RCMP raided the home of a guy who grifted $20 million of taxpayers for the Arrive Scam app. The Prime Minister failed to get the money back. This House ordered it. So will someone over there tell their boss to get the cash back? That's right. Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, uh, as I said yesterday in the House, uh, our government takes the use of taxpayers' money extremely seriously. We welcome investigations. We welcome investigations, Madam Speaker, that are taking place, including the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Uh, that, as is well known, publicly raided a residence uh, earlier this week. Madam Speaker, we've said anybody who abused taxpayers' money will face the consequences, and of course, we will seek to recuperate all money that Absolutely. has been misallocated. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Deputy the Honourable Member for Bose. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this Prime Minister who's not worth the cost, our farmers are crying out in large numbers this morning in Bose to express their anger at a government that's completely out of touch with reality. Our farmers are being asked to fill our pantries while the Bloc Liberal Coalition is blocking passage of Bill C-234, which would remove the carbon tax on propane and natural gas used to heat buildings and dry grain in order to lower food prices. Will the Prime Minister and the Bloc use common sense and say yes to this request from Canadian farmers? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. I find it strange that a member f for Quebec would ask this question about C-234 because it won't apply to Quebec. But last week, they had an opportunity to prioritize this bill. But what did they do? They switched it with a different bill. So they have to walk the talk, Madam Speaker. He should convince his colleagues to move forward on C-234. 
The honorable member for both. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This answer just proves how out of touch this government is. I invite the government on the block to go to Boast today and tell farmers that the carbon tax doesn't apply in Quebec. I've got room in my car after question period. No farmers, no food, Madam Speaker. Something the Bloc Liberal Coalition just doesn't get. The Bloc wants to radically increase the carbon tax again, proving once again that a vote for the Bloc will cost you dearly. When will the government finally pass Bill C-234 in its original form, Madam Speaker? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I don't know why it's a member for Quebec who's asking this question, because the bill will have no impact on Quebec. I would understand if it was coming from a member from Ontario. This member needs to convince his colleagues to move forward with C-234. It's their bill. They have that opportunity. They had the opportunity, but two or three times they've swapped it out for something else. Something else. That's not our fault. That's their fault. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker, yesterday my colleague for Drummond read the minister page 83 of the 2024 budget, which reads, expanding access to halal mortgages. The minister replied, no, no, we want to limit it. We just want to explore it, look at it, see if there's anything we can do. And besides, it's private. It's not a government program. In short, a great amount of unease. If they don't know where they're going with their halal mortgages, if it's not up to the government, if they want to frame it rather than expand it, what's it doing in the budget? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, and merci beaucoup pour la question. Thanks very much for the question. Not mean exclusion, and that's why we really need to make sure that we are protecting Canadians with products that already exist within our financial institutions, within private companies. And that's why the government is now announcing to consult with financial service providers and, uh, and diverse communities to understand how federal policies can protect Canadians from abuses. And I hope that all parties across the aisles can get on board with this to make sure that Canadians in this financial times and these economic times are protected. The Deputy Honourable the Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker, we may have a partial answer. Over the past few months, the media have been reporting dissatisfaction among members of the Muslim community with certain positions taken by the Liberal government. According to Radio Canada, a Muslim group even threatened to cut off the Liberal Party's funding of $680,000. That would mean they're leaving the Liberals for the NDP and the Conservatives. The Liberal solution, as always, is to pander. Are halal mortgages in the budget an olive branch extended to a fringe of the Muslim community? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker. I think the bloc is going off the rails a little bit. They don't know where they're heading with this. They don't want to vote in favour of the budget. Uh, even though there's good things in it for Quebec, there's a whole bunch of things that are, are important to Quebecers. So they don't want to talk about those things because they know it's good for Quebecers, but it's not good for the bloc. Excuse uh, the honourable member from the Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Pay your bills or buy your groceries. That's the dilemma for too many Canadians. Big oil and gas are doing just fine by gouging Canadians at the pumps and making record pro profits. Why? Because this government lets them. Liberals caved to lobbyists and stepped back instead of making big oil pay what they owe. And don't expect better from Conservatives because they're focused on taking Canadians' dental care and free medication. Why is this government letting ultra-rich CEOs rip off Canadians? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. By eliminating inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, Madam Speaker, by eliminating or introducing rather a tax on share buybacks. Uh, there's other examples I could give, but this government has presented a vision that says to the corporate sector and the oil and gas sector that they have responsibilities from a tax perspective. And what do we see? A revenue generated that goes towards funding vital programs in this country that ensure a fairness vision. That vi vision translates to child care, pharma care, a national child uh, school food program, among other things, Madam Speaker. Really? Good job. Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. These Liberals are so 
out of touch, Madam Speaker. And just as new Democrats have delivered social programs to help Canadians, the Conservatives are already campaigning to cut dental care and pharmacare, and it is absolutely shameful. People are drowning in debt just to keep up, while corporations are swimming in record profits. Liberals and Conservatives don't have the courage to challenge the status quo because it benefits them and their insider crony friends. Madam Speaker, new Democrats want to tackle corporate greed. Why won't this Liberal government? I want to remind the Honourable Member South uh, for St. Margaret's South Shore. Uh, he has a habit of heckling and, and raising his voice where he is not supposed to. I would ask him to please refrain to do so. The Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it's, it's very interesting. I've heard that member now for a number of years talk about, yes, the issues that he's also raised, but a vision on the environment, which I'm wondering where exactly the NDP is on these days. Carbon pricing is vital to this country's future. It really reflects an approach of responsibility from an environment policy perspective that I thought they stood for, but they're wavering, they're flip-flopping, and I sympathize, as others do, with the NDP. It's a very difficult time. They have tough decisions to make, but I hope that they end up on the right side of history with this issue, Madam Speaker. I really do. Honourable Member for Halliburton for Water Lakes Brock. Speaker, gas prices are the highest they've been in years. In my Ontario community, prices are as high as $1.80 a litre. Sadly, the Prime Minister gave no relief to Canadians and increased the carbon tax by 23 per cent. Worse, when the carbon tax quadruples, it will add 61 cents to the price of a litre of gas. It's clear the Prime Minister is not worth the cost, as Canadians work twice as hard to take in half as much. When will the Prime Minister axe the tax so Canadians can afford to get to work, get groceries, take their kids to practice? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, what's baffling listening to the members from the side opposite is that they're not listening to economists from across this country. Last week it was about 200 economists, now it's over 300, it's about 350 economists have written to us an open letter saying specifically that most families receive more in rebates than they pay in carbon pricing. In other words, the policy is designed to ensure it does not raise the cost of living for most Canadians. And they say climate change, on the other hand, poses a real threat to Canadians' economic well-being. I'm going to listen to the economists. A member for Halliburton, Kawatha, Lakes, Brock. Well, Speaker, the economists and the experts I listen to are the people in my riding paying $1.80 a litre for gasoline now. Yeah. The Prime Minister could reduce the price of a litre of gas by 20 cents right now by axing the carbon tax. Speaker, the Liberals have out-of-control spending and Canadians are broke. Rent, mortgages are doubling, inflation through the roof. We spend more money to service the debt than we do transfers to the provinces on health care. Canadians are tapped out, Speaker. They're seeing no relief from this government. So when will the Prime Minister do the right thing? Call a carbon tax election. Here, here, here. <laughs> Speaker, let's listen to another expert. The former Conservative Prime Minister of UK, Boris Johnson, came to Canada to teach the Conservative Party a lesson about the dangers of climate change denial nonsense. He said voters continue to care deeply about the environment. They have want solutions that are going to be cost effective. Madam Speaker, we agree, and both the PBO and over th 350 economists agree that the price, the carbon pricing, and the rebates will help 8 out of 10 Canadians better off. The Conservatives' only plan, Madam Speaker, is to let the planet burn. Their chief insult. Order, order. When the honourable member asks a question, he should listen to the answer and he shouldn't be heckling. And some of his colleagues were heckling as well. So I would just ask members to please tone down and, and listen to the questions and the answers that are being posed. The honourable member Calgary knows Hill. Well, Madam Speaker, after nine years, Canada's emissions are rising and the Liberal carbon tax is making life unaffordable. On April the 1st, the NDP Liberals increased the carbon tax and across the country today, Canadians are paying way more at the pumps. Many Canadians who have been struggling to pay their bills throughout the cold and dark winter, who might have been planning a summer road trip, might not be able to afford it now. Why are the NDP Liberals giving Canadians a cruel summer instead of axing the tax? There, there. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
think it's important that we be clear. Under the previous Conservative government, ambitions were on the way up with no plan to bring them down. Right. We are on track to meet our 2026 targets. We are on track to meet the Paris targets. We are taking the action needed to reduce emissions. But more than that, if we're going to talk about affordability, let's talk about an economist from Calgary who said carbon pricing is definitely not to blame for affordability challenges. Again, I'm going to listen to the economists. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. I choose to listen to the people in my riding who are paying 20 cents more a litre because of the NDP Liberal carbon tax. An inconvenient truth for the Liberals is that the only time that emissions went down in Canada was under Prime Minister Stephen Harper's government. In fact, if they want to listen to someone, they should listen to a fellow Liberal, the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, who after losing a by-election said the carbon tax is wrong. Tens of millions of Canadians agree. These are who the people we listen to. Why don't these NDP Liberals. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, if she's concerned, if the member opposite is concerned about the price of gas in Alberta, may want to speak to the Premier, who on April 1st increased the Alberta gas tax. And by the way, that's not connected to a rebate. Our federal carbon price backstop pays more to 8 out of 10 Canadians than they actually pay in carbon pricing. But the Premier's gas tax, that was just an add-on. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Madam Speaker, 40 per cent debt to GDP, the metric the Finance Minister used just last year as her anchor that she's now cut loose. $40 billion more in debt last year, $40 billion more debt projected this fiscal year, $40 billion debt projected the following fiscal year. I sense a pattern. After nine years of this Liberal NDP government, Canadians are being asked to hold the line at 40-something, but there's no real plan for that. Will the Prime Minister tell Canadians under 40 how much of their future he's blown? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The member opposite is a graduate of the Ivy School of Business in my riding, Madam Speaker. He knows economics, so he knows, of course, that Canada has the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7, and that GDP debt-to-GDP ratio is set to continue to come down. But what he's really saying by raising these issues is that they don't stand in favour of a vision of fairness for this country, one of child care, farmer care, dental care, and building more homes. The national uh, school food program that my colleague mentioned before is also vital to that vision. They stand against all of it. The Honourable Member Calgary Centre, and I want to ask members not to be heckling. Now, Mr. Speaker, it appears that member didn't get the memo, but what's causing inflation in Canada is actually deficits, and the Bank of Canada governor has said so. The interest cost to service Canada's growing debt has risen to over $54 billion, doubling in the last few years. It's now more than what we spend on health care. This is a cascade of debt obligations, and there is no plan to reverse it. This NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister advise why he continues a fiscal course that will saddle young Canadians with sky-high debt for years? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Now I really have to question the member's understanding of economics, Madam Speaker. I, I, thought, he, I thought he knew, but I wonder now. Inflation is a global phenomenon, and in Canada, in fact, it's declining. What I would say is back to that member, what is he going to do when it comes to voting on the budget? Is he going to stand and, and declare an intention to support childcare in this country, to make sure that we have a vision of fairness so that kids can go uh, to school with their bellies full, so we can have dental care in this country, pharmacare, all these things? He's against it. The Honourable Member for Juliet. Madam Speaker, in their budgets, the Liberals like to illustrate their measures with concrete examples of fictitious citizens. Let's give them some of their own medicine so they understand what seniors are going through. Rose is 72. Inflation is nipping at her heels. She can't afford groceries anymore. Gas prices are keeping her from getting out and about. Her taxes went through the roof in the last property assessment because of the real estate bubble. If she were 75, she'd get almost $1,000 more a year in OAS. But since she's 72, she gets nothing. Why are the Liberals turning their back on her? The Honourable Minister, 
Madam Speaker, our seniors are an absolute priority for the Government of Canada, and we've made very significant investments on their behalf. I'd like to ask my colleagues, since housing is a priority for Quebecers and access to housing is a priority, and fighting climate change is a priority for Quebecers, and since electrification of vehicles and economic growth are priorities for the Bloc Québécois, why are they voting against all that? The Honourable Member for Joliet, there's not a cent for seniors in this budget. Let's talk about housing. Imagine a Quebecer who's looking for a one-bedroom apartment in July but can't afford the $1,600 rent. He doesn't have access to affordable housing because the federal government has invested only 6 percent of the money in Quebec. And he sees in the budget that the federal government will backload until after the next election 97 percent of its spending on apartment construction and 91 percent of the investment in housing infrastructure. It'll be years before he sees the impact of the budget measures. And that's only if the Conservatives don't reverse them completely. Why not put the money up now? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Madam Speaker, I'm looking at everything we're doing doing in housing, for example, building new housing, accelerated con construction, the construction of affordable housing, helping young families in need, helping young families, young couples get access to property. And the Bloc is today saying that's important, but they're voting against everything we're doing. The Conservatives have so much influence over the Bloc that they keep voting along with them. It's shameful. Honourable Member for Yellowhead. After nine years, this NDP Liberal government has hit Canadians with another carbon tax increase of 23 per cent. Grocery prices are climbing, making families choose between heating and eating. Conservatives tried to ease this burden by passing Bill C-234, which acts as the tax on farmers. But this week, the Liberals blocked it. They are hell-bent on making life more expensive. If they are so confident in their costly plan, will they let Canadians decide and call for a carbon tax election? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'm Speaker. I want to be clear about the affordability piece to the way the carbon price works, because it's a carbon price and a carbon rebate. And I believe that the members opposite should be very clear with their constituents about whether they're asking the carbon rebates to not land in their bank accounts. Again, going back to what the economists state, an economist reviewed the carbon pricing and rebate system and said, we estimate that the medium annual net cost of carbon taxes for households in Ontario in 2023 was negative, meaning that most households received $300 more in rebates than they paid in carbon taxes. The Honourable Member for Simcoe Gray. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, they spend more servicing the national debt than on health care. After nine years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadian soldiers eat at food banks and veterans are living in their cars. After nine years of this NDP Liberal government, seniors can't afford to eat and they can't afford to heat. After nine years, Madam Speaker, despite deficit after deficit and record debt, the problems are getting worse. Canadians know the Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will the NDP Liberal government admit they have a spending problem, not a revenue problem? The Honourable Minister. Ms. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, that's a bit rich coming from the party opposite. Let's take a walk down memory lane. When they were in party, when the Conservative Party of Canada was in party under Stephen Harper, let's see what they did to veterans. They slashed the Veterans Affairs budget. They closed nine Veterans Affairs offices, and also they cut the, the workforce by 1,000 individuals that provided direct services to veterans. Mr. Speaker, we'll take no lessons from the Conservative Party of Canada. <laughs> Leamington. Madam Speaker, after the release of the tax and spend budget this week, everyone knows that this NDP Liberal government, after nine long years, and this Prime Minister are just not worth the cost. Bill C-234 was to provide some desperately needed relief for our farmers who produce food for Canadians. That bill passed this chamber. Then the Prime Minister bullied the senators into gutting that bill and leaving Canadians with higher costs. When will the Prime Minister call for a vote on the original motion or call a carbon tax election? Madam Speaker, uh, if the Bill C-234 was so important in the Senate, then why five members of their own caucus didn't show up to vote? And by the way, they had the opportunity to debate 
C234, when it comes back to the House, when we come back in one week, they traded two private members' bills, it wasn't C234. So it's so important, I would advise my member of Parliament, or my colleague, to lobby his particular colleagues and stop politicizing this issue. The Honourable Member for Lévis Latpinière. Madam Speaker, this government's liberal uh, inflationary policies have made everything more expensive. Gas has gone up so much, food is unaffordable, Canadians are hungry, and their housing is too expensive. The Canadian dream of owning a home is now out of reach for a generation of hardworking young adults. Madam Speaker, will a policy of a dollar of savings for each dollar of new programs be implemented by this inflationary government? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, we work hard every day to deliver for Canadians. Conservatives pretend to care. They've already said they'll vote against the budget this year. How cruel and heartless do you have to be to vote against feeding hungry kids Shame. or giving Shame. seniors the dental coverage Shame. they need to get their teeth Shame. fixed or supporting people with disabilities with hundreds of dollars tax-free more per month or building more child Shame. care spaces so parents can get back to work or providing insulin to people living with diabetes? You can't vote against those things if you actually cared. They don't care. So the Honourable Member for Victoria. Madam Speaker, the Liberals should never have bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Right. It threatens our climate and our coasts. Yes. And Canadian taxpayers are now on the hook for this government's irresponsible spending to the tune of $35 billion. Liberals ignore, ignored the calls from environmentalists and coastal Indigenous nations, instead choosing to be in the pocket of big oil and gas. Why does this government keep backing big polluters when they know this pipeline is an environmental and economic disaster? Yes. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. If Canada, if Canada is to succeed, Madam Speaker, we know that we have to get our resources to market, and that's why the TMX pipeline is so important, but the member knows, or ought to know, that the government does not intend to be the long-term owner of the project. A divestment process will be initiated once the project is more advanced, de-risked, and essentially with consultations, and essentially when consultations with Indigenous peoples are completed. This is the vision that we've always laid out, and it's one that we'll stick to. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. In their budget on Thursday, the Liberals made a lot of announcements on housing, but they did not make the $600 million investment in the territories that Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and the Yukon have been desperately asking for. When I go home, I'm told more heartbreaking stories of crumbling and overcrowding crowded homes. Why won't the minister listen to the territorial premiers and give them the funding they need to address the housing crisis? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for her question. She's been a strong advocate on housing across the Arctic and northern reason, regions. We are the first government ever in history to have uh, direct agreements with Indigenous governments to address their housing needs. We have invested billions of dollars, in fact, over $3 billion in housing across the territories in a number of ways to help increase the housing and ensure that people have housing that is affordable to them. Climate change means more flooding events of increasing intensity and severity. Homeowners in areas prone to flooding, like those in parts of Pierrefonds in my riding, hit by flooding in 2017 and 2019, worry about the rising cost of flood insurance. And that's if they're lucky enough to remain eligible for flood insurance coverage. Can the Minister of Emergency Preparedness tell this House how this week's budget is coming to the aid of climate-vulnerable homeowners. The Honourable Minister of Emergency Preparedness. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the member for his very strong advocacy on flood protection. Uh, we know that the devastating impact that climate change is having on Canadians. Insurance companies are paying uh, billions of dollars and that those costs are being passed on Canadians, making it even more expensive to, uh, to own homes. With the Budget 2024, we are increasing our investments on national 
a low-cost uh, flood insurance program. Over the next year, we will work with the province and territories to put this program in place. And, Madam Speaker, we will be there for Canadians when climate change impacts their lives. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Madam Speaker, this week the RCMP raided the home of the Prime Minister's top arrive scammer, Christian Firth. The raid is connected to a proposal that Firth's GC strategies sent to the Deputy Prime Minister and her former Chief of Staff, Jeremy Broadhurst. So, what communications did the Deputy Prime Minister and her office have with GC Strategies regarding a proposal that has led to an RCMP raid? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, again, just because my colleague on the other side of the aisle repeats something doesn't necessarily attach it to the facts. The facts, Madam Speaker, in this case are well known. The RCMP the one thing that he said is that's entirely factual is the RCMP are looking into this matter. And that's why I would urge people to be careful before they invent things and ascribe mm -hmm. things to what is an ongoing police investigation. Our government has said that people have a responsibility to be judicious with taxpayers' mm -hmm. money, and those that aren't will face the consequences. I remember St. Albert and the tin. Madam Speaker, the two-person basement company GC Strategies received more than $100 million from this yep. NDP government, including $20 million for nothing on a rive scam. We know of a link between GC Strategies and the Deputy Prime Minister and her office regarding a proposal that has led to an RCMP raid. So, has the Deputy Prime Minister been contacted by the RCMP and will she fully cooperate with the police investigation? Again, Madam Speaker, my friend on the other side simply asserts a series of things that he knows very well are not accurate and attempts to connect the series of dots that mm. simply can't be connected. Yeah, that's obvious. He should stick to the basic facts. The RCMP following information that was given to them by the Border Services Agency has decided to look into a series of allegations. They obviously take their work very seriously, and we should allow Canada's National Police Force to do their work and not simply make up stuff in the House of Commons beside the work that they're doing. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Regina, Wiscana. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this Liberal NDP government, this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost or the corruption. The Arrive Can app was originally supposed to cost $80,000, only to skyrocket to $60 million, triggering an RCMP investigation. The contractor admitted to this House that he does not feel ashamed, and the Liberals have not even asked him to repay the money. Madam Speaker, when will the Prime Minister get Canadians their money back? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Madam Speaker, I had a chance earlier in today's question period uh, to answer that question. I'm happy to do it again. Madam Speaker, our government has worked with the Auditor General's Office, with parliamentary committees. There's an internal investigation being conducted by the Border Services Agency. All of these investigations will, unlike some of our friends on the other side, establish the facts of what happened. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's misused taxpayers' money will be required to repay it, and anybody who has misused taxpayers' money will face the consequences. And that's why we're pleased that the RCMP are looking into this matter. Here. for Regina, West Canada. But, but, Madam Speaker, this app went live four years ago in the early days of the pandemic and has been the subject of questioning and scrutiny ever since. While Canadians were losing their businesses and being told by this Prime Minister that we were all in this together, insiders at GC Strategies were milking taxpayers for millions of dollars. Madam Speaker, when will the Prime Minister get taxpayers their money back on a rive scam? The RL Minister. Madam Speaker, we have said continually, and we'll say it again, if people have misused taxpayers' money or have misappropriated public funds, of course efforts will be undertaken to recuperate that money. That's what a responsible government does. But a responsible government, Madam Speaker, allows the internal reviews and audits that are underway to determine exactly what money uh, might be subject to the reimbursement and what's the appropriate process to have that money reimbursed. And at the same time, Madam Speaker, the RCMP are also looking into this matter. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher-Les Patriotes-Vercher. 
Madam Speaker, gas went up by 15 cents in one single shot on Thursday morning. It's highway robbery. And that's not because of the carbon tax, which doesn't apply in Quebec and didn't change Thursday morning. Why did it actually happen? Because of these greedy oil companies. They're getting ready for a summer by taking money out of people's pockets. Companies like Suncor and CNRL, which raked in $8 billion in profits last year, and yet they're being subsidized by the Liberals. Over 10 years, $83 billion. The Liberals also bought a $34 billion pipeline. Isn't it time to cut off the money for these oil companies? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, the oil and gas sector has to pay its fair share. It's bringing in rep record profits and needs to invest in reducing emissions. We have eliminated inefficient subsidies to fossil fuels. And we're asking the wealthiest 1% to pay a little more. The Conservatives are against our cap on oil and gas emissions. The Conservatives, in fact, are taking their marching orders from the oil and gas sector. Order. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Well, I think that the Liberals are going to have to tell us what an efficient subsidy to the oil and gas sector would even be. Now, the carbon tax doesn't apply in Quebec and has only a 0.15% impact on inflation. But Conservatives from Quebec are constantly weeping and wailing about it, whereas when gas goes up by 15 cents due to their fossil fuel friends, they don't say a word. There's complete silence when the oil and gas companies take money out of Quebecers' pockets. Same thing when we say that the government should stop paying fossil fuel companies. Does this government think that it's a good thing that they pay through the nose to these oil and gas companies, and yet these companies make consumers pay more? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I'm glad we're hearing the truth from the Bloc Québécois which is that the federal carbon tax, the federal carbon price does not apply in Quebec. They should speak to the Conservatives, who don't seem to understand this. We agree that all sectors of the economy need to reduce emissions, including oil and gas companies. We are doing that work to ensure that it happens. The Honourable Member for... No, not the Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I meant to say Madam Speaker, Canadians are struggling to put food on the table, on the table rather. Meanwhile, this Prime Minister's Arrive Can app has made the GC Strategies owners multimillionaires. Canadians could have gotten some answers about Arrive Can this week, but instead the Prime Minister enforced silence and ignored Canadians' questions. This is $60 million in taxpayer money, money that went into the pockets of millionaires. Will the PM give Canadians this wasted money back? The Honourable Minister of Transport. No, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 the Honourable Minister. No, there's the Minister of Transport over here. I'm not the Minister of Transport. Now, Madam Speaker, thank you. As my colleague knows, it's simply not true that the government wasn't transparent. My colleague keeps saying that, but he knows it's not true. I've been working with parliamentary committees. We've been working with the Auditor General. General. We completely agree with the idea that all those who inappropriately receive taxpayer money We'll have to pay it back. And as my colleague knows, the RCMP is investigating this matter. I need this there, Cam Camera the Honourable Member, Madam Speaker, at a time when Canadians are working so hard without being able to actually get appropriately compensated for their work, consultants involved in the Arrive Can disaster received $60 million. That's taxpayer money. Taxpayer money that was wasted. And they got that money for doing no work. So Canadians have a simple question, and the answer should also be simple. When, when will the Prime Minister give taxpayers their money back? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Madam Speaker, as I said in English a few moments ago, my colleague knows that there's an inquiry happening at the CBSA, an internal inquiry, and it's 
for that exact purpose, to find out whether money was spent inappropriately, we're going to have to wait to understand what the facts are before asking for money to be paid back. We understand Canadians' concerns about this. We share Canadians' concerns about using taxpayer money appropriately. Calgary Rocky Ridge. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister's Arrive Scam app was supposed to cost $80,000. The Prime Minister chose the app, mandated its use, and along with the NDP, voted $60 million to fund it. Shady contractors got rich without doing any IT work, while the app itself failed and erroneously sent tens of thousands of Canadians into quarantine. The RCMP are knocking, the main contractors got $20 million. When will the Prime Minister get Canadians their money back? Yeah. Yeah. Madam Speaker, the same question begets the same answer. We've yep. said from the beginning same the answer. government has welcomed the scrutiny of parliamentary committees, worked with the Auditor General, and implemented her recommendations. My colleague, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, has changed the way that these contracts are awarded and the oversight provisions. We'll continue to do what's necessary to ensure taxpayers' money is well spent, and we'll continue to obviously hold those to account that don't follow the rules. The Honourable Member for Ottawa Vanier. Madam Speaker, our veterans and their families have sacrificed a great deal for our country. We have a solemn, sacred duty to support our veterans who served with honour and courage. We know that it can be difficult for a veteran transitioning to civilian life to access medical care. When they were in the armed forces, veterans received their health care from the forces directly. Can the Minister for Veterans tell us how she will help veterans and their family have access to these services? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my friend and colleague for her important question and her hard work for veterans in her community. Budget 2024 will increase support to veterans and their families. Telemedicine services throughout the country will be offered to veterans and their families. That is one of the significant measures for veterans in this new budget. The pilot project has been a success. Broadening these programs will help veterans access health care during their transition to civilian life. Our government will always be there to support veterans and their families. Thank you. The Honourable Member Sturgeon River Parkland. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, Canada has entered uncharted territory. This government has made Canada a candy store for car thieves, and under their watch, organized crime has made Canada a key exporter of deadly fentanyl. Canadians and now the whole world know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. This NDP Liberal government must take responsibility for this failure, which has brought crime, chaos and corruption, not only to Canadian streets, but the streets of the whole world. Perhaps is there a Liberal Party leadership candidate who can rise and tell us who's been running this place for the past nine years so we can hold them to account. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Look, fear-mongering does nothing to encourage Canadians to have more confidence in our justice system. We have one of the safest countries in the entire world. We had an auto summit just a few short months ago where we brought all of the different parties together. Since that time, you've seen an increase in the uh, measures taken by police and other authorities across the country, including the federal government, and car theft is going down and recovering of stolen cars is going up. These measures continue to work, and we will continue to work with other levels of government and other necessary authorities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this Liberal government has been in power for nine years. We all know this, but I will repeat it. This government is not worth the cost. Montreal is turning into the Wild West. Criminals just don't care about authority. In fact, on Wednesday, some car thieves actually tried to run over police officers. Is, should that really be the case in a civilized country like Canada? Will the Prime Minister of this Liberal Bloc Québécois coalition, will this Prime Minister finally put an end to these lax crime policies and put these reoffending auto thieves in prison? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Madam Speaker, one of the pieces of good news in the budget, of which there were many, and my colleague knows this very well, is that my colleague, the Minister of Justice, has committed to making amendments to the Criminal Code. 
specifically for that purpose, to change to change penalties for car thieves, as my colleague is saying, we have had discussions with our essential partners to prevent auto theft, and we will continue to do all that is necessary to prevent this problem. Prince George. Since 2016, over 40,000 Canadians have died from overdose. Over a billion dollars has been spent with zero results. BC's Deputy Commissioner of the RCMP has confirmed that organized crime is indeed trafficking safe supply. It's going straight from the pharmacy to the hands of criminals unleashing crime, chaos and disorder in our communities. After nine years of this Prime Minister and his NDP servants, Canadians are finding out that they're not worth the cost. When will the Minister of State Supply take responsibility for her failed drug policies and put an end to taxpayer-funded drug f policies? Thank you, Madam Speaker. We need all partners working together to address the illegal toxic drug supply in our communities. We have and we will continue to support provinces and territories so, they, so that they can deliver the full suite resources that are needed. Our government will use every tool at our disposal to end this national public health crisis. The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Madam Speaker, Canada's support for Ukraine has been unwavering. Unlike the Conservative Party opposite, which has voted against Ukraine multiple times now, we are stepping up our support through Budget 2024. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development please tell this House about the important news for Ukraine through the latest budget? Here, here. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Madam International Speaker. Development. Our government has been there since day one for Ukraine. Budget 2024 is yet another step in making sure that Ukraine wins in its fight against Putin's illegal invasion. This budget includes almost $3 billion in additional financing, including for lethal and non-lethal weapons, including funding through the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for the reconstruction of Ukraine, and we'll see how we can use seized Russian assets for the restoration of Ukraine. We have always been there to support Ukraine. Here, here. Hey, Tony. The Honourable Member Churchill, Kiwana Nukaski. Madam Speaker, the NDP successfully fought against cuts to Indigenous services, but it's clear the Liberals still don't get it. Let's look at housing and infrastructure, where the Liberals spent less than 1% of what First Nations need. First Nations here in Manitoba face a serious infrastructure crisis, but this government still delays helping them, preferring to pat themselves on the back for just not being Conservatives. Will the Liberals commit to partner with Manitoba First Nations to build the infrastructure they desperately need, including on the airport in Wasagamac? and the desperately needed east side all-weather road. The Honourable Minister of Indigenous Services. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for her ongoing advocacy. Since 2015, we've increased spending on Indigenous priorities by 180 per cent. That's right, Madam Speaker. That's the abysmal state that we received uh, this file in, in 2015 yeah, from a previous Harper Conservatives who gave zero cares about yeah, the lives of Indigenous zero. people. In fact, Budget 2024 dedicates over $9.5 billion to Indigenous priorities, a full 25 per cent of the budget goes towards Indigenous priorities in this country, we'll continue on the path of reconciliation together. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Madam Speaker, in the midst of a climate crisis, the oil and gas industry raked in $38 billion in pure profit in 2022 by gouging Canadians at the pumps, fueling inflation. And despite claims of fairness in this year's budget, we learned this week that big oil's lobbyists convinced this government to shelve an excess profit tax on these record-breaking profits that could have generated $4.2 billion to help make life more affordable for regular Canadians. Can anyone in this government Government justified to Canadians. What's fair about this? The Honourable, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would remind the member what I said earlier when the NDP posed the question on this issue. Introducing a inef excuse me, eliminating inefficient fossil fuel subsidies and introducing a tax on share buybacks. In addition, changes to capital gains that will benefit 
on the whole, the vast majority of small businesses in this country, by decreasing the inclusionary rate and increasing the lifetime capital gains exemption, means that it's the largest corporations that will be asked to pay more to ensure a greater vision of fairness in the country. And that brings us to the end of question period on this Friday. I have a point of order, the Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I, I understand.